Hi and welcome to the online lecture for Electric Charge, Coulomb's Law, and Superposition for General Physics 2. Just a word about these online lectures. Uh, on occasion throughout this lecture and others, I will be asking a question and then pausing briefly to ask you to think about that on your own. Obviously, I, there's no way I can force you to do that since you're watching this online, but this will be more effective if you watch these lectures uh, with some scratch paper next to you and do pause the video when it's suggested that you do pause them, think about your answer, sketch the picture that's asked for before continuing on uh, watching the lecture. And in fact, we'll start out with one of those uh, because we need to start by talking about what electric charge is. Most of us have been through a science class before where we've learned something about atoms. So I would encourage you uh, to pause the video and on a piece of paper, sketch a model of an atom and label as many parts of that model as you can. Here's my sketch and I'm guessing that uh, many of you have something that look like this as well. Um, there is a nucleus in the center and that nucleus contains two kinds of subatomic particles, one that we call protons and one that we call neutrons. And then around the nucleus moving and sometimes people draw them in orbits like this, other times you have um, orbits drawn at different eccentricities, so the picture looks a little bit different. Uh, but there are another uh, subatomic particle called electrons that are in motion around that nucleus. And there's a lot more detail, obviously, to the parts of an atom uh, that we know. Uh, in fact, this particular model picture, which is often called the Bohr model, is now known to be wrong, but it, it's right enough for us to understand the electrical properties of things that we want to study in this course and since the electron cloud model based on quantum mechanics is more complicated both to draw a picture of and to understand uh, we can stick with this kind of model of an atom to think about how things uh, develop electric charge and how they respond to one another once they have this property that we call electric charge. So you may have learned in your previous course uh, that protons are considered to be electrically positive, electrons are considered to be electrically negative, and neutrons are considered to be electrically neutral. Uh, if you've not, I'm introducing that for a first time, but uh, most of us again have run into that in a previous science class uh, somewhere along the road. So another question that this brings to mind is how do we know when an object is electrically charged? Well, uh, given that nobody can actually see an atom, uh, I suppose the correct answer to this question is we can't. Um, no for sure, but the model that we have of electric charge and of atoms seems to work in uh, describing the observations that we make, for example, in the lab that you do early on in this class when you test various objects for their electrical charge properties. So we know when an object is electrically charged, I suppose you say, uh, uh, theoretically, when um, there's some sort of imbalance of the number of protons and electrons so that you have more negative charge than more than positive charge or more positive charge than negative charge and we know that's electrically charged because it seems to interact in certain ways with other objects that are themselves electrically charged this isn't a great holistic definition because we'll see there are some exceptions to this rule in fact sometimes things that are electrically charged interact with things that are electrically neutral though they still contain charges but in general, at this point, we'll say we can test to see whether an object is electrically charged by bringing it in the neighborhood of something that we know contains an electric charge and seeing how uh, the thing that we suspect might be electrically charged reacts to uh, the known charged object. How many types of charge are there? Well, I sort of gave that away uh, in the previous conversation, but there is thought to be just two types of charge. And because in physics we want to use the tools of mathematics to describe nature, um, we've found it convenient to consider one of those charges to be positive and the other to be negative. Turns out when we get into working with electric circuits uh, a little bit later in this course that the choice that was made to call electrons negative and protons positive was a little bit unfortunate. There's a small bit of our life that would be easier if people had considered electrons to be positive and protons to be negative, but we're stuck with the convention that was established and that most of the world adopted. Uh, if an object is charged, do we know the sign of the charge? 
It's a good question. If we know something is electrically charged, for example, you pull uh, your socks out of the dryer and very often they're sticking to each other and to the other clothes and so people call that uh, static or static charge and so you know or at least suspect that they are electrically charged, but are they positive? Are they negative? Uh, again, this actually turns out that we only know the sign of the charge if we know, uh, if we can test it in reference to something else that we actually know the sign of the charge uh, for. So at some point we have to assert this thing right here is negative and then test everything else relative to that thing that's negative uh, and categorize those other things as negative or positive based on how they interact. So fundamentally you don't know the sign. There's nothing that absolutely says electrons are negative and protons are positive. But they were assigned that convention several hundred years ago when folks were first working on this topic. And we can only know the sign of unknown charged objects by bringing them in the proximity of uh, things that we know the charge of and observing their interactions. What kinds of objects can be charged? Well, this might surprise you, and whether you're watching this lecture before or after the lab, I suppose matters a little bit. Uh, but if you're following the structure of this class, you're watching after you've done some experiments in class with some devices, giving them electrical charges and changing their electrical charges. And what surprises most people is that it turns out pretty much anything can be charged. And in fact, things that are considered electrical insulators are often the easiest to electrically charge, which seems counterintuitive to many of us when we first think about this. This, of course, has to do with how conductors and insulators behave, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. Uh, a couple more questions for you to think about, and again, I'd encourage you to pause the video, think about it before listening to my answer on this. But if you were just handed a random object, how would you determine whether it was neutral, positive, or negative? Well, uh, if I were handed some object and I was asked to figure out whether it had an electrical charge, the way that I would do it is take something else that I knew I could uh, give an electrical charge to. So, for example, that sock coming out of the dryer or when I was a kid, actually I still do this, when you rub an inflated balloon on your head, uh, it becomes electrically charged. The tapes that we worked with in the lab pulling apart, those become electrically charged. So if you take something that you know to be electrically charged, you can take your unknown object and uh, observe whether it interacts with the other object and whether it attracts or repels. I have to be a little bit careful here though because very often uh, the, the tendency is to say, uh, well, if, if, it, if I have a known positive object and then my unknown object is attracted, then it's a certain charge and if it's repelled, it's another charge, but if it doesn't do anything, it's neutral. Well, it turns out in many, many cases, Neutral objects themselves attract to things that are electrically charged, so it can be tricky. Another one to think about. Suppose there were a third type of charge. Now, I've already given away on the previous slide that scientists don't think that there is. They think there's only a positive or negative, but how in the world do we know that? How in the world do we know that there are only two types of charge? What tests could reveal that an object has this third charge? Well, you might know from either your experimenting in lab in this course or previous experiences that you've had that if something is electrically positive and something is electrically negative, those two objects end up attracting each other. If you have two objects that are positive, they end up repelling. And if you have two objects that are negative, they also end up repelling. Hence, we say things like like charges repel and opposite charges attract. Well, that would mean then that if you had a object that had a third type of charge, uh, it couldn't, for example, uh, attract to a positive object and repel from a negative object because that's what another negative object would do. It would have to have some set of interactions that were different from the interactions that are undergone by things that we know the charge of. So, for example, if I took this unknown green sphere and I brought it near this positively charged red sphere, and I noticed that it was attracted to the red sphere, but then I brought it next to the negative uh, blue sphere here, and it was also attracted to the negative blue sphere. That would be different than something that was known to be positive or known to be negative would do. 
Uh, or if it happened to be repelled from both the positive and the negative, uh, that would be again a different property. And it turns out uh, that at least in the latter case, repelled from things that are both positive and negative, we've never found anything that does that. Uh, now, the first case where something that is unknown is attracted to things that are both positively and negatively charged, we actually do observe that. We observe that in the lab. And it turns out that in that case, our model suggests that that third object is not actually charged. It's electrically neutral, but the charges within that object are rearranging themselves in the proximity of the charged object that it's interacting with. Uh, and that's sometimes called polarization. Uh, we've seen that a little bit in the lab, and we'll talk about that more uh, a bit in the future. All right, so insulators and conductors, again, these are words that most of us have heard by this point. Um, but some questions that lead us in that direction. Uh, one of the premises that we have about our model of electrical charge is that electrical charge, being something that's possessed by atoms, can't be created or destroyed. And this is one of many things that in science are considered to be conserved. And so occasionally you'll hear about the conservation of charge. Uh, so if we posit that you can't create or destroy charge, how would you make something charged? Uh, if you can't destroy some of its negative charge or add some of, uh, or create rather some new positive charge on it or something similar. Well, the answer comes uh, in that we, uh, at least according to our models, believe that we are able to move charges around. And so you can actually add extra electrons to an object. That makes the object have more negative charges than positive charges, and it's now considered to be overall negatively charged. You can pull electrons off an object, and uh, now it has more positive charges than negative charges. It's considered to be positively electrically charged. And it turns out that moving electrons is the only way the scientific models allow us to describe how things change their electrical charge. Protons, again, are found in the nucleus, and if you've had some chemistry previously in your life, you know that the protons also determine the identity of the material. So if you start changing the number of protons in the nucleus, which I guess is not technically impossible, but we can't do it in our electrostatics lab, uh, you actually change the material into some other kind of material. So all the models that we need to develop uh, are going to rely on electrons moving around. And objects get classified by how freely they allow this charge to move, these electrical charges or these electrons. Conductors are materials that allow relatively free movement of charge. And it turns out when you put charge on these objects, uh, because like charge repels from other charges like itself, uh, the charge tends to distribute itself over the surface of a conductor in an attempt uh, to get as far away from the other like charges as possible. An insulator, however, is a material where charge doesn't move freely when it's charged, and the charge is generally localized. That is, it stays wherever it was placed initially. It doesn't have a tendency to move around a great deal. Uh, notice again, that doesn't say that insulators cannot be charged. In fact, when you're studying electrostatics, where electric charge is moved uh, in brief periods of time, but then tends to stay in one place uh, during a set of observations, insulators, like the balloon that you rub on your head or uh, the plastic rods that you use in the lab, are actually good devices for storing electrical charge because the charge doesn't move around easily on them. Uh, everything is not a conductor or an insulator. Um, some of the best conductors are things like silver, copper, and aluminum. Uh, things that are really good insulators that don't allow the movement of charge uh, are things like rubber, glass, and wood. Uh, and then there is this category of materials in the middle uh, called semiconductors that under certain situations behave like conductors and other situations behave like insulators. Uh, we won't study those in this particular course, but other physics courses, if you're interested, study the physics of semiconductors and how those devices that are based on semiconducting materials uh, work. Okay, another thought experiment here. If I had three identical metal spheres, A, B, and C, uh, and sphere A carries a charge of plus 5, whatever units that is, we'll talk about those units in a moment, Sphere B carries a charge of minus 1, and sphere C carries no net charge, so it is electrically neutral to start. Uh, and then we do a series of actions. Uh, we touch sphere A and B together and then separate them. 
Uh, and then we touch A and C together and then separate them. And finally, we touch C and B together and separate them. Uh, a few questions about this. What's the total charge on the three spheres before they're allowed to touch each other? Uh, how much charge ends up on sphere C? And what's the total charge on the three spheres after they have touched? Well, uh, if we assign A a plus 5 and uh, B a minus 1 and C neutral, which I've called 0, you add all those numbers up and the net charge would be plus 4. Uh, again, uh, arbitrary units in this particular case. All right, so now we touch A and B together. Well, it's important in this particular situation that these are metal spheres. Metal is a good electrical conductor. So if you bring two things together that are metal uh, that contain different amounts of charge, that charge is actually now going to redistribute itself on those two objects, uh, again, trying to maximize its distance from any other like charge. Uh, and what you end up with is equal amounts of charge on both of those uh, objects, as long as, again, these are identical sizes, which the problem suggests they are. So if I touch A and B together, I have a combined charge there of plus 4, because, again, C doesn't have any of the charge when I start this scenario. That plus 4 will equally distribute itself onto sphere A and B. So now I'll have a situation where I have plus 2, plus 2, and 0. Uh, I then bring sphere C into contact with sphere A and separate it. So A, C has 0. A, once I pull it away from B, has plus 2. Between them, that's a total charge of 2. And that means that uh, 1 plus 1 is going to be transferred over to sphere C and plus 1 is going to remain on sphere A. So now I've got 1, 2, and 1. Uh, and finally, if I touch sphere C to, C to sphere B right here, between the two of them, they have plus 3 of charge. That will equally distribute to plus 1.5 and, and plus 1.5. How much total charge do we have in the three spheres after they've touched? Well, 1.5, one 1.5, and, one and, and 1. Add all those together, we still have plus 4, which we need to have, and that's a good check if we've done this correct. We had plus 4 of charge to begin with. We better have plus 4 of charge to end with if we can't create or destroy charge. Another question about charging spheres to think about, how could you give two identical metal spheres exactly equal amounts of charge? And it turns out uh, doing this is tricky if you try to keep the spheres separated and just, you know, rub a balloon on your head and then touch metal sphere one, rub the balloon on your head again and touch metal sphere two, because it's very unlikely that you'll put equal amounts of charge uh, on the two spheres using a technique like that. But if you do have a certain amount of charge on uh, one sphere and then you bring it in contact with the other one, the charge does this automatically as long as these are identical metal spheres because, again, the charge is trying to equally distribute itself over those objects. Could you give them charges of opposite sign but exactly equal magnitude? Think about that for a second and, again, pause the video if you uh, are so inclined. Turns out the answer is yes, but it's hard to think about how you would actually do this because, uh, again, it's not easy to do something where you add X amount of charge to sphere A and then remove the same amount of charge from sphere B uh, precisely. The way that you actually end up doing this is if you start with two identical metal spheres, and let's just assume they're neutral. They don't have to be in this example. Uh, if you bring them together so they're touching each other, and my apologies, I didn't animate this, so again, the whole system still has zero worth of charge. Uh, then I bring something over to one side of the system, let's say on the right-hand side, that has a positive net charge on it. Well, that positive net charge is going to attract electrons. So we'll say 100 electrons leave the sphere over here on the left, and they migrate over to the sphere on the right. Again, remember, these spheres are touching in an attempt to get close to this positively charged object. Well, that means I've added 100 negative electrons to the sphere on the right. I've removed 100 negative electrons from the sphere on the left, leaving the net charge on the left. Whatever the opposite charge or the positive charge of 100 electrons would be, because I've left now more protons than electrons. So when I've transferred them, if I then separate the spheres out so they're sort of as pictured again, uh, I've then trapped 
those electrons that moved from one sphere to the other on the second sphere, and I've left a situation where I have uh, the opposite sign but exactly equal magnitude because the net charge that end up on, ended up on one sphere was pushed away from the other sphere. Could you do either of these things with plastic spheres? And the answer is uh, not, not really. You can give them uh, equal types of charges and you can give them opposite kinds of charges, but because plastic spheres don't allow charge to freely move, uh, it would be very difficult, I would venture impossible, uh, to give them exactly equal charges uh, or exactly the same number of charges but the opposite sign of charges. Because both of the examples we talked about previously to this uh, hinge on the conducting nature of the metal spheres and the ease of charge moving on those surfaces. Uh, multiple choice question for you here uh, and one that asks you to think back to your general physics one uh, ideas that you've learned. Um, which diagram best represents the force vectors between the two charged spheres below? So I take my same two spheres. The one on the left, let's say, has a charge of plus 5. The one on the right has a charge of plus 1. Uh, which of these force diagrams would best represent the forces that they would exert on each other? And again, I would encourage you to pause the video until you have your answer before continuing. Well, the answer turns out to be case one, and if you got that, congratulate yourselves. But it's not uncommon for somebody to guess case two or case three. Those are easy distractors. Um, because we say things like, well, the one that has more charge must push on the one that has less charge more, or something like that. And it's easy to make sense of that in our minds. Uh, but these charged objects, just like the objects that you studied when you were working on mechanics back in Physics 1, uh, follow Newton's laws of motion. And the one that's important right here is Newton's third law of motion, which you may recall says something to the effect of when, when one object exerts a force on the other object, the second object exerts an equal magnitude, an equal size, but opposite direction force back on the first object. That's kind of a full uh, description of Newton's third law. A lot of people just learn things like for every action, there's a reaction. Uh, and that might be useful in some situations, but um, often, in fact, leads people to wrong answers when you learn something like that. Um, but this is an example of Newton's third law. We have two objects that are interacting. So whatever force object A puts on object B, object B puts an equal amount of force back on object A. Uh, but in the opposite direction, so number one has to be the correct uh, situation right here. And it turns out that when electrically charged objects are interacting with each other, the size of the force between them uh, ends up depending on how much charge each of those objects have, uh, as we shall see shortly. So, continuing our thought experiment, if you could measure the force between two charged spheres, which, by the way, is actually very tricky to do, and uh, Coulomb and the others that came up with this physics a few hundred years ago must have had an enormous amount of patience to take the measurements that they did. Uh, how does the force charge 1 exerts on charge 2 compared to the force charge 2 exerts on charge 1? Well, we just answered that on the previous slide. They should be equal to each other because that was the only way they would obey Newton's third law of motion. If you doubled the amount of charge on sphere 1, how do you think the force would change? And if you doubled the amount of charge on sphere 2, how do you think the force would change? Well, if your intuition is that doubling the charge would at least increase the force or double the force, you would be correct in that situation. That's what our experiments uh, have revealed to us, or not the ones we've done in lab, but ones others have done before us. Um, and the way at least I make sense of this in my mind is I say, okay, imagine these two spheres had no electrical charge. Well, then I wouldn't expect them to have any electric force uh, between them. Uh, then I introduce some electric charge and they have some amount of force between them. It makes sense, at least in my mind, to say, well, if I put more charge on them, there's a bigger force in between them. If you move the charges, though, so that they're half as far apart, so they got closer together, uh, what do you think that would do to the force? And it turns out, in that situation, it increases the force, but it doesn't double it. Uh, it actually makes it four times as large uh, 
And this actually can be reasoned from data that we took uh, in the first lab experiment that we did in this class. So here's some imaginary data. You have some real data for one part of this that you did uh, in that experiment. But imagine that you could simply take those two spheres and change dynamically the amount of charge that was on sphere one and measure how big the resulting force was uh, that sphere one was exerting on sphere two or sphere two was exerting on sphere one. Uh, you would find that that would be a linear relationship and the way we can mathematically talk about that is to say that the force between those two charges uh, is proportional to the charge on sphere one. And the symbol Q is used to stand for charge in the uh, equations that we write in physics. Uh, if you did the same thing, so now you didn't mess around with the charge on sphere one, but you changed the amount of charge on sphere two, you would find again that that would be directly or linearly proportional, and we could say that the force was proportional to the charge on sphere 2. What if now we kept the charges constant, but we just messed with the distance between the spheres? And we actually do this via some video analysis in the lab. Uh, and what you should have seen in doing this is that as you increase the distance between spheres, the force between the spheres decreases. Uh, and so that leads you, if you think about the math of that relationship, to say, hmm, maybe that's an inverse proportionality. In other words, maybe the force is proportional to 1 over the distance between spheres. When the distance gets bigger, that means the force gets smaller. Well, if you plot that, force between spheres versus 1 over the distance between the spheres, or the inverse of the distance between spheres, you find out that, well, you're sort of correct but that that relationship still has a definite curve to it, uh, and it's not a one-to-one -one relationship here. In other words, if one over the distance doubles, that doesn't double the force. Uh, instead, we end up plotting uh, force as a function of one over the distance between the spheres squared before we see that uh, linear relationship or that direct proportionality. And that confirms for us that the force must be proportional to one over the distance between the spheres squared. Now we're going to do something that we will do a handful of times in some of the modeling labs in this course, and that is to say, okay, if the force is proportional to the charge on sphere one and proportional to the charge on sphere two and proportional to one over the distance squared, how do we put all those together? And it turns out that mathematically, if you know that A is proportional to B and A is proportional to C, that A must be proportional to the product of B and C. In other words, you can multiply the right-hand sides of all these proportionalities together and make a statement that is itself uh, still true. The force between the two charged objects is proportional to the charge on each, and it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So here is the merging of the proportionalities. Well, electric charge is measured in something called coulombs in honor of uh, I believe the French physicist who did uh, many experiments in electrostatics that established the ideas that we have today. Um, so Q, charge is measured in coulombs, but it's just an amount of charge. Uh, it turns out coulombs is easier for most of the things we do than counting charge in, say, the number of electrons. Distance, uh, as was the case in physics one, we typically measure in meters, though that doesn't, there's no rule that says it has to be. Uh, and so if we think about this, we get a coulomb times a coulomb over a meter squared. So the units on the right-hand side of this expression would be coulomb squared over meter squared, which I'll tell you right away is not the same thing as a newton. And force, you may recall from physics one, we measure in newtons. So we need some way to make the right-hand side of this equation equal a force in newtons. And it turns out we do something that has been done many, many places in physics, though maybe not pointed out to you, we introduce something called a proportionality constant. In this case, it's the lowercase k, uh, and that lowercase k is literally just a number that makes these two sides mathematically equal so that we can calculate how big a force is before. If you use this, you only know that they're proportional. You can't actually numerically predict the force. In this uh, framing of it, you can actually numerically calculate how big the force is, and it turns out that many experiments reveal that constant of proportionality is about 9, uh, but more precisely 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. And it has a bunch of units to it, but 
most of these units are just to cancel out other units. It's a Newton meter squared over a Coulomb squared. Well, the Coulomb squared in the denominator of this unit, of this constant rather, is going to cancel the Coulomb squared that I'm going to get from the charges in the numerator here. The meter squared is going to cancel the meter squared that I get from the units in the denominator here. So I'm going to be left with Newtons, which is what I want. That's the standard unit of force. So let's do a couple of problems to wrap this lecture discussion up. Uh, the structure of a sodium chloride crystal is shown in the figure, and I don't know if you've studied crystal structure in a chemistry class in your past, but uh, these are sodium uh, atoms and chlorine atoms that are actually ionized, which means they either pick up an extra electron or they lose an electron, and they arrange themselves in this sort of uh, pattern within the sodium chloride crystal. So each sodium ion is positive, that means it's lost an electron, and it's adjacent to a chloride ion, which has gained an extra electron. The electrical force of attraction between the sodium ions and the chloride, uh, chlorine ion, chlorine, pardon, ions holds the uh, crystal together. So a couple of questions. What's the magnitude of the force between the adjacent sodium and chlorine ions, which are 2.82 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, a, a very small distance apart, and what's the resultant force on any ion in the crystal? Well, uh, the sodium ion is missing one electron, so its charge is the charge of an electron, and you can look up in your book or Google uh, that the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, but it would be positive for the sodium ion. Chlorine ion has one extra electron, so it has a charge of minus the fundamental charge, which is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Uh, but I'm just going to figure out the magnitude, so I just care the size of these. I don't actually care about the sign of them. And we can use Coulomb's Law to calculate the force between those. So Coulomb's Law says the force equals K times Q1 times Q2 over R squared. K is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. The fundamental charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs. We square that. The distance between them is given in the problem as 2.82 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Square that as well. Throw all that into a calculator, and you come out with about 2.9 times 10 to the negative 9 newtons, which in the size of forces you studied in physics 1 is not enormous, but again, we're not dealing with enormous particles here uh, that we uh, have in this sodium chloride crystal. What's the resultant force on any ion in the crystal? Well, Turns out it would be zero, and we hope it actually is zero, because if there is a net force, uh, it should be accelerating according to another one of Newton's laws of motion. Uh, and the reason, the way you can think about this is if I have a sodium ion, it's got a chlorine ion directly above it, directly below it, right in front of it, right behind it, to its left, to its right, and so all of those would put the same size forces on that sodium ion uh, and keep it in place, and the net force would be zero on that ion. Alright, what happens if we make things a little trickier uh, and have to deal with some two-dimensional analysis here? What's the magnitude and direction of the net electric force on charge B? So in this situation I imagine I've glued three charges uh, to these positions, not glued, but they, they can't move uh, because I'm not concerned about their motion uh, in this situation. They're going to be stationary for the sake of our calculation. So charge A is positive and it's 1 nanocoulomb. Uh, nano is 10 to the minus 9. Uh, and it's typically to see charges in microcoulombs or nanocoulombs in this section because 1 coulomb of charge is actually a rather enormous amount of charge. B is a negative charge, minus 1 nanocoulomb. C is positive 2 nanocoulombs. Uh, and it is down here at another corner of this square that is 5 centimeters square. So the way we figure out the magnitude and direction of the net electric force on charge B is we actually say, okay, well, what's the force on charge B from charge A? What's the force on charge B from charge C? And then what's the resultant when I put those both together? So the force that A puts on B, use Coulomb's law again, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared times, let's see, charge A has 1 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, charge B has 1 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Notice I'm just plugging in magnitudes here. I'm not worried about directions. I'm just doing a magnitude. There's no vector arrow here. Uh, 
Uh, and the distance between them is 5 centimeters or 5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. You've got to make sure you get your uh, denominator in units of meters if it's not given in meters because the constant has the distance in meters that you're going to be canceling with there. Crank all that out and you find 3.6 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. If you find the force that C puts on B, the calculation is very similar, but now C is 2 nanocoulombs, so that actually doubles the force, and that's 7.2 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons, which means if we sketch what the forces look like, here's B, here's the force that A puts on B, which would be an attractive force towards A, here's the force that C puts on B, which would be an attractive force towards C, and notice I've put the tails of those force vectors on the object that I'm uh, analyzing. And if I add those two forces together, you should recall from your work in General Physics 1, that's a vector sum, and so I have to add those together, and the net force uh, points off at an angle here, um, and we will shortly figure out how big that is and what angle that is. To figure out how big that net force is, most people like to use the Pythagorean theorem, so if you imagine you slide this force over here, you'll form a right triangle, and the net force is going to be the hypotenuse of that right triangle, so it's going to be the square root of the squares of the, no, rather, the square root of the sum of the squares of the two sides, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if I do 3.6 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons, square it. Add 7.2 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons, square it. Throw all that into a square root, I'll get about 8 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. And if I figure out the angle right there, uh, there are many ways to do that. I would use a trig function. Uh, I would use the tangent function because I know, uh, again, if I slide this force over here, I would know the opposite side of my right triangle and the adjacent side of my right triangle. Those both factor into the tangent function. And the tangent would be the inverse tangent of 3.6 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons over 7.2 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. But it turns out that's just the same as the inverse tangent of 1 over 2, uh, and that is 27 degrees. So we could say that the net force is 8 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons, that's specifying the magnitude, uh, at an angle of 27 degrees uh, in this particular situation. Uh, so superposition, uh, which we've actually done here without saying the word, is the combination of two or more physical states, uh, such as waves, but in this case forces, to form a new physical state in accordance with this principle. It's just a fancy way of saying, hey, if I have a complicated situation, I can figure out what the physical effect is from object A, I can figure out what the physical effect is, in this case, from object C, and then I can combine those two effects, those two forces, to find what the overall force is. If I had a fourth charge, I could then add a third force into the situation, and I could keep doing this uh, until I'd added up all of the forces. The net force, then, is going to be the sum of all of those, and that's one place where we see this principle of superposition at play. We'll see it in a couple of other places uh, throughout this course. All right, this concludes the uh, lecture on electric charge and Coulomb's law and superposition. Uh, if you've noticed any errors in this lecture, I always appreciate those being pointed out, and I hope this was a helpful resource for you.